The stereotype of the colonial Puritan is that of a grim, black-clad fortitude of faith held out in the frontier wilderness of the New World. We tend to think of them as profoundly uncompromising, rigid dogmatists whose commitment to radical Calvinism allowed them to remain steadfast, even cold-blooded, as they instituted an often ferocious form of biblically inspired justice. Of course, so much of this is inspired by the horrors of the colonial witch trials, first in Connecticut and then in the infamous trials of Salem. And to be fair, stereotypes are often stereotypes for a reason. But to be a bit more fair to the actual historical Puritans, the situation is rather a bit more complicated. And I think an interesting window onto just how complicated Puritan congregational Christianity was was just how the form of Jewish mysticism and theosophy, the Kabbalah, was introduced into North America. What we find is a rather complex development of New World Protestant religious development, Old World esoteric speculation, and Jewish Kabbalistic concepts coming together to form the core of a truly American form of religious life and eventually national destiny. If you're interested in Kabbalah, Theosophy, Hermetic Philosophy, or the academic study of the occult, make sure to subscribe to the channel and check out my other numerous topics on esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism for free here on YouTube, I'd hope you consider supporting this project on Patreon or with a one-time donation. As you can imagine, producing content like this is pretty expensive, and it's only by your support that I can make this kind of content available for free here on YouTube. You can find those links below, and I really do appreciate your consideration of supporting the channel. Now, let's turn to just how Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism, first entered the world of puritanical colonial North America. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Before turning to the first adventures of Kabbalah in colonial North America, you might be interested in better setting the stage of the occult more generally in the colonies. While we think of the Puritan realm as ferociously repressive of any religious heterodoxy, much less downright sorcery, you might be surprised that magic, astrology, and alchemy thrived, at least to some degree, in colonial North America. In fact, this episode on colonial Kabbalah is kinda the second in a series on colonial occultism that I feel compelled for whatever reason to make this time of year. I suppose it's esoterica does Thanksgiving, but I think I'm probably just rationalizing at this point. Regardless, make sure to check out the first episode on occultism in colonial America in the card above if you're interested in that kind of thing. So by way of introduction and to better appreciate why the Puritans would have any interest at all in Jewish mysticism, it's important to recall just how sold they were on those ideas that are fundamental to Protestant values. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Grazia, Sola Christus, and Soli Deo Gloria. That is, that salvation is achieved through Scripture, by faith, through grace, and Christ, unsurprisingly, and for the sake of God's glory alone. That first one, through scripture alone, was absolutely decisive for the Puritans. So much so that the American colonies would go on to have one of the highest literacy rates in the world in the 18th century, precisely because of their emphasis on studying the Bible as an essential part of one's salvation. Secondly, they weren't going to let some papist antichrists, as they would have had it, or the Roman Catholic Church to be a bit more charitable, much informed that process. Thus, they were left with 
two testaments, one of which, the new one, was rather accessible, but the other one, which was the old one, the Old Testament, was filled with, well, some pretty weird, strange stuff, you know, visions and stuff like that. Well, given that Protestantism still had that new car smell, where were they to go to unlock all those pesky, weird bits of the Old Testament? Well, the, the thing had been given to the Jews, and this is the, the real zinger, they even had this, the Jews, had this secret system of deeply decoding the Old Testament that they called Kabbalah, which they alleged went all the way back to Moses. Thus, the Protestants generally, and the Puritans and Quakers more specifically, were much more open to incorporating Kabbalistic ideas into their larger theological project insofar as they, well, appeared to support the specific agenda of Protestantism, especially over and against Catholicism. Thus, Kabbalah first appears in the colonies as a tool of Protestantism to justify and extend its theological reach. That might strike our ears as cultural appropriation or what have you, but history continues to give not a single damn about our modern concerns over political correctness. So, given all that, it appears that the earliest Kabbalistic text to appear in the colonies is a small manuscript tract which appears to have been written by the heterodox Quaker George Keith around 1688. Now, my Puritans out there are kind of like, what kind of Quaker isn't heterodox? But Keith was especially interesting to the degree to which he was influenced by the trifecta of the Cambridge Platonists, early continental theosophy, and Kabbalah, all of which eventually got him expelled from even the mainline friend movement in 1694, before his eventual going over to the Anglican Church. Keith had actually introduced Quakerism into the circle of the Cambridge Platonist Anne Conway, whose 1690 The Principles of the Most Ancient and Modern Philosophy is among the most extraordinary texts of early modern philosophy. It was even written by by Anne Conway, a woman, can you believe this? A woman wrote a, a very important text in the early modern period that philosophy departments conveniently don't read. And that circle, among whom Franciscus Mercurius von Helmut could be counted, would also convert Keith over to Christian Kabbalah. Now recall, this was the real heyday of Christian Kabbalah, especially in Protestant circles, with the publication of the Kabbalah Denudata by Christian Nor von Rosenroth in 1677-78, and, I think more importantly, the publication of the Sulzbach Zohar in 1684. The circle around Conway was among the most theologically avant-garde of the day, introducing not only Kabbalah into these discussions, but also the works of the German Kabbaler mystic, Kabbaler mystic, Jakob Berma, who Hegel, yep, that Hegel, called the true first German philosopher. And it's in that interplay that we see the first text of Kabbalah appear in the colonies in 1688. Specifically, Keith is responding to a colonial edition of Berma's work that was published in 1688, edited by Daniel Leeds, but printed by William Bradford. In fact, it's one of the oldest documents printed outside to the south of New England. Leeds and Bradford, you might recall from my other episode on colonial occultism, were also responsible for an astrologically infused almanac that was also condemned the year before. It sounds like a couple fun chaps to hang out with. Well, they also published an epitome of Burma's thought called the Temple of Reason for the Little World, which was rather polarizing even among the Quakers of the time. It was this work that seems to have inspired Keith to further compose an attack on Burmian theosophy from the point of view, at least of his interpretation, of the Kabbalah. He was on Team Kabbalah. Thus, the 1688 Kabbalah of the Hebrews is a sustained polemic against early continental theosophy, which itself was actually probably influenced by Kabbalah, some debate, and remained polarizing in those very Quaker circles. His central concerns are the coincidence of opposites, the idea of good and evil both existing in the Godhead, the primordial androgyne nature of Adam prior to the fall, 
and the dual Christ theology, which really underwrote much of Quaker theology as he saw it in the part Sufim concept in the Zohar and Lurianic Kabbalah. Indeed, Keith's 1688 manuscript track, The Kabbalah of the Jews, contains a near-running summary of much of how Lurianic Kabbalah was taken up into Protestant circles in the late 17th century, and it's amazing that it went completely unnoticed until being rediscovered in 1935. In fact, it contains, to my knowledge, the very first image of the Sephirotic Tree of Life ever put to paper in North America. Now, the Bohemian Temple of Wisdom was, let's call it, poorly received by the Quakers of the time and was an object of profound derision by the Congregationalists, our friends the Puritans. In fact, a year before the friends disowned Keith, some friends, right? A 27-year-old Cotton Mather would publish the first in a series of tracts attacking Keith's rather specific and honestly idiosyncratic theology as a kind of straw man and proxy for Quaker theology more generally. In fact, the copy of the 1688 Kabbalah of the Jews that survives was probably copied out by a go-between between Keith and Mather, a dude named Christian Lodewijk, or Ludovic, who was claimed by Mather to have been lately recovered out of Quakerism. He was sort of a convert to Congregationalism. In an extraordinary series of back-and-forth polemics, both Mather and Keith argued for their positions, often employing a shared appeal to Kabbalistic sources, especially the Zohar of all things, to make and break their respective points. Specifically at target would be Keith's claims about how a series of reincarnations, which Cotton correctly identifies with the Hebrew term Gilgul, or Galgal as he incorrectly has it, would ensure that the peoples in the world, all peoples in the world according to Keith, would eventually come to salvation through a process of reincarnation. Also, there were debates around how divine names do or don't hide occult secrets to the degree to which primordial wisdom or biblical and Kabbalistic text describe the pre-incarnate Christ. Similarly, the relationship to the Shekhinah, to the Christian notion of the Holy Spirit, the exact nature of the Adam Kadmon in relationship to Christ, and the specific Quaker idea of the inner light or inner Christ. This is sometimes referred to as the dual Christ theory that was very controversial. And the resurrection of the body from an invulnerable, imperishable bone in the spine. Yeah, that's an idea found in the Zohar. This truly is a witness to the degree to which Kabbalah was already infusing itself into the very specific Protestant polemics, both on the continent, but amazingly enough, in the colonies as well. In fact, recall why it did so at all. Mather is learning about Kabbalah from primary Protestant sources only in the interest of grounding and extending Puritan theology. In fact, he's perfectly happy to dismiss or historicize Kabbalistic sources and texts any time they contradict his worldview. I think he actually calls them rabbinic fopperies at one point, which is a great insult, just honestly. This is observable in the polemics with Keith, but also in his massive commentary on the Bible, the first such text to be composed in North America. There, Cotton Mather is, like I said, happy to include a range of selections from Kabbalistic texts, though they aren't always accurately translated or even from the books he, he thinks they are. I thought you should always check your sources. In fact, Cotton himself never consulted a Kabbalistic text firsthand, much less in the original language, to my knowledge at least, again, doing so largely through earlier Protestant translators and exegetes. In fact, Kabbalah was already indirectly affecting the colonies by the late 1660s as news of Shabbatai Tzvi's messianic agenda and failure reached the region. Yep, Shabbatai Tzvi reaches America. Increase Mather, Cotton's father, had in some sense held out hope that Shabbatai would actually overthrow the Sultan just as Martin Luther had in some sense defeated the forces of the papist antichrist, the Pope, and along with the foundations of the New Jerusalem already laid in North America, this would somehow all serve to inaugurate the end of days. Yep, the apocalypse. It always comes back to the apocalypse. 
With Shabbatite V's conversion to Islam kind of derailing that whole plan, Increase imagined that rather than that, a mass immigration of Jews to the New Jerusalem in New England, and of course their subsequent conversion to Puritanism, would now herald the end of times. Also, this kind of dovetailed with Cotton Mather's interest in the Jewish Indian theory. You know the theory that Native Americans were actually the lost tribes of Israel and Boy, did this idea have legs. I mean legs, like Joseph Smith, Golden Plate, Latter-day Saints legs. Regardless, Increase and Cotton Mather now both came to see America as playing a decisive role in the history of the world with the immigration and conversion of the Jews as part of an anti-Shabbatai, anti-Catholic angle, forming a kind of vision of the apocalyptic end of world history. Honestly, it's not much of an exaggeration to locate at least some of the origins of American exceptionalism here as part of Congregationalist eschatology as an indirect result of the collapse of the Messianic movement inspired by Lurianic Kabbalah vis-a-vis -vis the failure of the Messianic claims of Shabbatai V. Again, the shadow of Shabbatai V cast itself long, long into modernity. But for this whole Matharian, Congregationalist apocalypse to go down, you need, well, Jews to immigrate to the New Jerusalem and New England and convert to true Congregational Christianity to, to kick off the apocalypse. And they only had to wait like 56 years after the failure of the Messianic movement of Shabbatianism to get their first convert, Yehuda Monis. Now, there had been some Jewish presence in North America for a little bit of time. There was a tiny community in Rhode Island and a small one also in New York. The total Jewish population of the time was less than one-tenth of one percent of the population of the colonies, so small in fact that they couldn't even attract a full-time rabbi until the late 18th century. Though, the Turo Synagogue in Rhode Island, there in Newport, remains the oldest continuously functioning synagogue in North America. So if you find yourself in Newport, pay him a visit. But with the conversion of Monis, the now elderly Cotton Mather felt that this was the tectonic shift he and his father had been looking for. Monis, an Italian Jew who seems to have actually been trained under the anti-Sabbatian Yaakov ben Aaron Sasportas, was ideally suited for the task of becoming what the Mathers called the new Jew. This was a Kabbalistically trained anti-Sabbatian and anti-Catholic in the New World. Monis, as you may also know, would go on to become the first professor of Hebrew at this little place called Harvard, whatever, big whoop. And he also composed both the first Hebrew grammar and the first explicitly Kabbalistic text published in the colonies in 1722. In honor of his conversion, which was really attended by the colonial academics who's who of the time, a collection of speeches and tracts was published in 1722 by Daniel Henchman, including a series of essays by Monis entitled The Truth, The Whole Truth, and Nothing But the Truth. Yes, you heard that correctly. It was printed by Daniel Henchman, who has an awesome name, and who was actually one of the most important early printers in Boston at that time. Also, yes, it's from American jurisprudence. At any rate, the final essay in the collection by Monis, a text called Nothing But the Truth, is actually a sustained Kabbalistic defense of Protestant Christianity meant for his brethren by the flesh, that is, other Jews, but I honestly think it was just as much to convince the wasps in the room that his conversion was really on the up and up. This brief essay ranges from why the Shema prayer proves the existence of the Trinity. Recall the Shema says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, that uh, hero Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord is one, thus uttering words for God three times, thus God must be triune and united as one. There's also some strategically translated sections of the Zohar and other Kabbalistic texts, some of which are they're kind of medieval frauds, and some even good old-fashioned gematria. Again, all of this is meant to show the reality of the Trinity and Christian orthodoxy. Though the Protestants would have hated me to say it, 
This was actually part of a long, unfortunate history of Jewish converts to Christianity being made to use their former religion as a grounds for other Jews to convert. It's sort of using the weapons of the Jews against the Jews. This is a long thing going back into the polemical Latin tradition. Regardless of the merits of the arguments of nothing but the truth, this 1722 work of Yehuda Monis is the first truly Kabbalistic work written and published in North America. Now, he had just converted from Judaism, so there's, there's that, but yeah, sure, okay, 1722, first work of Kabbalah in North America, published work of Kabbalah. Also, what's a bit odd is that Monis actually had a pretty sophisticated notebook filled with Kabbalistic extracts that he had brought with him from Italy. Conspicuously missing from nothing but the truth is really any of that material. It's as if he just ignores perhaps one of the most substantive collections of Kabbalistic literature in the colonies at that time that he directly had access to in the composition of nothing but the truth. Also, he had some of the magical alphabets from Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy copied at the end of that little notebook as well, with his names in one of those occult alphabets, in a hand other than his own. Now, just what all that occult alphabet stuff means isn't really clear to me, but mysteries likely still abound. While Nothing But the Truth does mark the first truly Kabbalistic text produced in the North American colonies, there's virtually no evidence that printed Kabbalistic text in their original languages had yet landed by the time of Yehuda Monis's conversion. Instrumental in that process would be the eventual seventh president of Yale, another small little school you may have heard about, Ezra Stiles. He became a gifted Hebraist, Stiles was convinced that the Kabbalah legitimately held profound and ancient secrets and is among the earliest colonial Christians to seek out both texts in the original languages back on the continent, but get this, also sought out actual Jewish people. Can you believe that? Actual Jew. He wanted to talk to actual Jewish people actual rabbinical authorities in North America to learn Kabbalah from. And it's to his absolute credit that Stiles deeply respected his Jewish teachers and study partners, and there's actually very little evidence of his seeking out their conversion, which is, remember, actually saying a ton for these days. He didn't try to convert them, it seems. I think he wanted them to convert. There was no active attempt on his part to proselytize them. Again, though it's still part and parcel of that deep Puritan drive to correctly understand scripture given that they, the Puritans, thought that secret Jewish Kabbalistic technology handed down for eons would help them do so. Stiles, it seems, was originally inspired by the Monist text, Nothing But the Truth, and about eight months after reading it, wrote a letter to a friend in London requesting that he help Stiles obtain a copy of the Zohar with the original Aramaic and Latin translation. Oh yeah, that friend was Benjamin Franklin. Yeah, Benjamin, key on a kite, father of France, we all better hang together, otherwise we'll hang separately, Franklin. Well, Franklin appears to have kind of drug his feet and two years later, on October 29th, 1772, Stiles received a copy of the famed Sulzbach 1684 edition of the Sefer Zohar, the first known copy to have arrived in North America. The Kabbalah had landed. In the years that followed, Stiles would study with a range of rabbis. It would include other famed texts to his collection, including the Sefer Yetzirah and the Sefer Bahir. This is sort of an interesting quirk about the colonial situation. The small size of the Jewish community meant that an intermittent string of part-time rabbis, all of which brought a unique angle or group of knowledge with them, thus providing Stiles with a steady and interesting stream of study partners, all of which he actually heaped a ton of praise upon later in his writings. In fact, some of those later praise kind of sound a little homoerotic, which is kind of cool. These Kabbalistic study sessions made such a profound impact on Stiles, 
that when he first addressed Yale as its seventh president in 1781, he imagined a future American education system based at least in part on the Chavrusa system, or traditional Jewish pair study, and on the ancient Talmudic academies of Babylon and their rabbinical lineages through the ages. In fact, that very speech was originally composed by Stiles in the Hebrew language in 1778, revealing a commitment to his own profound experience of Jewish learning and for a tolerant education-based America with a kind of Kabbalah-guided pernealism at its heart. This is the sentiment I think echoed by George Washington's famous letter to the Turo Synagogue that it is, quote, it is now no more that toleration is spoken of as if it were the indulgence of one class of people that another enjoyed the exercise of their inherent natural rights. For, happily, the government of the United States, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. Of course, the writer of that, General Washington, hardly lived up to that sentiment himself. He was the largest slave owner in the colonies, but it's one of those ideas that we can proudly aim for today ourselves. The history of Western esotericism and the occult in North America is truly important history and deserves better than being just a grab bag of nonsense conspiracy theories. I'm looking at you, all you anti-Mason people. After tracing some general themes, I hope this episode reveals that the reception of the Kabbalah, there's a bad interlingual pun for, for you there, has proven to reveal an interesting intersection of Quakerism, Congregationalism, Continental Theosophy, and even some of the seeds of American exceptionalism in the apocalyptic vision of the Mathers. We are profoundly lucky to have such solid scholarship like the recent Kabbalah and the Founding of America by Brian Ogrim to help understand it better. In fact, this episode would have been impossible without his incredibly fine work of scholarship, and I highly recommend you go pick it up, especially if you're interested in the history of Kabbalah, colonial American religiosity, or the early history of Western esotericism in America. Again, I hope you'll subscribe, check out my other content on topics in esotericism, and I hope you consider supporting my work of making content like this that's scholarly informed and completely free here on YouTube. I hope you consider supporting my work on Patreon or with a one-time donation. Again, you can find those links below. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.